So one of the recurring kind of conversations that I have with people over time uh, comes up along the lines of, uh, they make a statement like, well, I know I haven't been perfect. I know I haven't been perfect, particularly at times of death, at funerals and stuff, as people are thinking about eternity, they're thinking about what's gonna happen to them when they die. Well, I know I haven't been perfect, which is always kind of funny, because I'm like, oh, you're kidding. Like, we thought you were, right? Um, just like you think I'm perfect, you know, right. Yeah, exactly, nobody thinks I'm perfect, just FYI. But we say, oh, you know, we say things like, well, I know I haven't been perfect, but I, and then we like fill in the blank with something. Like, I'm good. I try to be good. You know, I coach my kid's soccer team. I, I give, you know, I pay my taxes. I'm a hard worker, right? Um, I do all the things, you know. I show up. I go to church. And, and, and then we finish this statement like, well, I know I haven't been perfect, but blah, blah, blah. And then we finish it with something along the lines of like, and I hope right? I hope I've been good enough. I hope I've been good enough for God. Like, I hope my good deeds outweigh my bad in the whole scheme of things, that when we go up to heaven, there's some scale up there, and God's going to, like, play a, a movie of my life, which sounds like a version of hell, not a version of heaven, but, you know, he's going to play this movie, and I hope the good outweighs the bad. I hope that I've been good enough for God. I hope that he accepts me, but I'm just not completely confident and if you've ever wondered that, I'm glad you're here today. Because I think that wondering plays into something deep inside of us that's part of our soul quest. Our soul quest. And that's what we're talking about in the series. Uh, we began this last week to kick off the new year. If you weren't here, I would encourage you to go online and check it out um, because we talked about a lot of things. We talked about this realization that we all come to at some point in time that there's got to be more to life than this, right? Whatever this is for you, that deep inside of us, we go searching for all kinds of things in life. We go searching to climb the corporate ladder, to acquire a certain amount of wealth, to retire and get to travel, to have our kids, to have them be successful, to be on the winning team, to get into the college we hope we get to. And we've done that. Like we got the t-shirt, everything was great. But then there comes this point in time where we have this kind of feeling inside, like, ah, oh, it just wasn't quite enough. Like there's something that I'm missing. It wasn't what I hoped it would be or thought it would be, which is why, you know, 40-year-old men go through the midlife crisis. Even though they've got everything, there's this feeling like they're, I'm missing something. Whatever this is for you, there's got to be more to life than this. This isn't enough, which I actually think is kind of where our culture is right now. As we look around our world, as we look at people being dissatisfied and frustrated in life, feeling anxious, you know, feeling depressed. And as we go throughout this life, acquiring all this stuff and doing all these things and having all these experiences, and yet it never quite being enough. That's our soul quest, this thing that we're looking for that never quite fulfills us. And so last week, we kind of broached this topic, and we began by asking two really important questions. Uh, the first one is, where are you? Where are you? Not spatially. Obviously, you're in the room, or if you're watching online, hopefully you're you know, watching the treadmill as you're running or whatever you're doing. Um, but, but where are you in relationship to God? Where are you relationally, particularly with God? Because one of the interesting things about, uh, about humanity is that as we go searching for things, as we go searching for wisdom, as we go searching for experiences, as we go seeking knowledge, oftentimes that pursuit leads us away from God. If we're not careful, it leads us away from God. And so we're not always certain even where we are in relationship to God. So has it led you away? Where are you? Are you satisfied where things are in your relationship with God. And then secondly, the question is, who do you say Jesus is? Now, the, it's important about the who do you say, like an emphasis on you. What about you? It's possible, we talked about this last week, it's possible to believe that Jesus is the son of God, but to not actually have him be God in your life. It's possible to believe that he is the Messiah. That's what Peter, that's what we talked about last week. Peter, um, he, he was the first person to recognize this is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus applauded it. He even changed his name. Like it was, he was known as Simon before this point in time. So like, this was a big deal, right? And then just after that conversation, Jesus says something about what's going to happen to him. He's going to be crucified and all this stuff. And Peter's like, no, 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 that's not how it's going to work out. You know, you might be the son of God, but I'm going to tell you how it's going to be, Jesus. 
And it's very easy, if we're not careful, to believe he's the son of God, but to say, no, you're not going to be Lord of my life. I'm not going to allow you to control who I am. But when we do allow him inside, when we do allow him to be the center of who we are, we discover something inside of us. We discover some of those answers to that soul quest, this journey that we're on where we're seeking and we're never really finding uh, there, there's a very famous kind of Christian father known as Augustine. Um, Augustine was born to two parents who one was a devout Christian woman, the other was a very non-devout Christian or not, non-Christian man. And Augustine followed in the footsteps of his father, and it was kind of like a meaningless pursuit in life. And he came to this restlessness, this feeling of there's got to be more to life than this. And one day he felt this prompting to open up the pages of scripture and he opened it up and and what he opened up to was exactly what he was dealing with personally. And so in 386 AD, Augustine gave his life to Jesus and uh, he became the Bishop of Hippo. And he wrote a book called Confessions, which is kind of this this pursuit inside of us, this thing inside of us. And, And in this book, Confessions, he said this, he says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our heart is restless. Our heart is restless until it rests in you. Like we can search the whole earth, we can have all the experiences, we can do all the things, and yet we still find within ourselves an emptiness, a restlessness, knowing that there has to be something more. Something within us wants to go on this soul quest. Something inside of us knows that there is God. And that wondering, that Uh, soul quest, that search, it really plays into that thing that we were talking about a minute ago, hoping that we've been good enough. It's what leads us to the asking of that question, have I been good enough for God? And, And when we ask that, we discover a piece of our quest that's a little bit hard to nail down. We discover that sometimes there's something inside of us that that really does wonder, and that question indicates that we feel there's something that's maybe getting in the way. Whether it's something from our past, um, maybe it's something in our present, sometimes it's a habit, it might be a mindset, but, but we come to God and, and we approach him with this feeling of, oh, there, there's something there, there's some kind of block that's actually maybe keeping me from following you. And it's when we can identify what that thing is that we can really make some headway in this journey. Now, we're not the first people to experience that and to ask those questions and to wonder about all these things, this this soul quest. We mentioned that last week. And there's an experience that I want to share with you about a young man who came to Jesus one day who was wrestling with all of these things. And what's fascinating about the answer that that Jesus gave to this man is it was two things. On on one hand, it was brilliant because he asked this kind of surface level question and Jesus just like peels back the the layers of the onion, right? And, And he gets deep down and he's like, no, this is what you're really dealing with. Let me just tell you what it is that you're dealing with. And so so he does that. But it's also, quite honestly, it's unsettling. And the reason why it's unsettling, well, I'll just let you experience that for yourself because it's just as unsettling for me as it probably will be for you, and I'm certain it was for the man who experienced it. So here's what Matthew tells us. Matthew was present for this interaction, presumably, and he said, a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life. All right, I mean, that's kind of our question, isn't it? How good do I have to be? What's, what's the good that I'm missing? What good thing do I have to do? Because deep down, I have this wondering. It doesn't feel like I've gotten this thing that I'm searching for. I'm not sure I'm confident that eternal life is mine. And so Jesus responded to him. He said, why do you ask me about what is good? Why do you ask me about what is good? Now, it's kind of interesting because what Jesus is doing is he's playing with the guy a little bit. He's kind of saying, okay, you know, Good as defined by whom? Like you're kind of treating good as if it's this human construct. And the reality is we all probably have a sense of right and wrong, good and bad, right? I mean, we have that. Even, even if you grew up in like the worst possible home where there were no morals, there were no values, right? No, no sense of, of right and wrong. You still have an innate sense. It's why cheaters don't like being cheated, Liars don't like being lied to. Thieves don't like being stolen from. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a store um, searching for something that was not on the shelf, and I asked a gal who was working there about it, and she said, oh, we had to take those down because of the five-finger discounts. I was like, oh, 
and it just makes me so mad. Quite honestly, I'll just be straight with you. It makes me mad, the five-finger discount thing in our culture right now. And I just said, I was like, ah, oh, I'm so sorry. And, and she's like, well, you know, who am I to judge? Everybody's got their reasons. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, even thieves feel like it's an injustice if somebody steals from them, right? I mean, it, there's just this sense of right and wrong, of good and bad. And, and so this man knows this, and Jesus is like, okay, who's going to define good? How are you going to define good? Is it by God's definition or is it man's definition? And here's what Jesus said. He said, there's only one who's good. Right? I mean, there's only one who's good, and if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Good originates with God, and in case you're curious what good is, let me point you to how God defined it for you, nation of Israel. Now, last week we talked a little bit about this, and in case you weren't here, I'll just give you a background. There, there are 10 commandments. You've probably heard of those before. Most of us think that those 10 commandments are good, don't we? I mean, you might not be able to name any of them. <laughs> if I asked you to name them, like don't lie, you know, don't steal, don't commit adultery, those are usually the three that we can come up with. But I mean, innately, we're, we're kind of like, yeah, those, those probably were good. And, and the context of God giving this to the nation of Israel is he had rescued them from slavery. About a thousand years, a little more than a thousand years from the time Jesus had this conversation. They were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And, and they had been praying for salvation. To, none of the Egyptian gods helped them out, by the way. And then one day, God raised up Moses, and Moses led them into this promised land where he delivers the, you know, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai to the people. And, um, and God basically says, look, I'm your God. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to care for you. And he gives them the, kind of the rules of engagement. Here's how it's going to work. How's, here's how it's going to be with me. Here's how it's going to be with the people around you. And so here was the first one. Here's what he said in Exodus. He said, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. Here's the first commandment. You shall have no other gods besides me. Because no other God saved you. No other gods rescued you. I did. And so have no other gods before me. And then he goes on, he says, don't, and don't make statues of me, by the way, because back in this time period, people would have their little statue gods. And what's great about the statue god is when you want it, you can pull it out. And when you don't want it, you can shove it in the satchel, right? I mean, you can kind of control that god and get that god to do whatever you want to do. God's like, no, you're not going to control me. And then he said, don't misuse my name, which didn't mean saying a bad word when you hit your thumb with a hammer, by the way. It meant don't attribute things to me that are not of me. Don't, don't try and make it like I said you should do this and I didn't say you should do this. And then he said, keep the Sabbath holy, which was his way of saying, take a day of the week and remember who upholds your life. Take a day of the week and remember who provides for you, who cares for you, that God, I am the Lord your God, I sustain you and I rescued you. And then he goes into all these rules about how to care for other people, how to be a good friend, how to be a good son or daughter, how to be a good husband or wife, how to be a good neighbor. And so Jesus is like, look, God defined good for you. So just keep those. And the man didn't like that. He wasn't satisfied. Keep the commandments. Here's what he said. He said, which ones? Which ones? I mean, now, now, I mean, this was just like, you know, if you're Jewish, you knew the Ten Commandments. You just kind of grew up knowing those. That, that was your deal. They, that, they memorized those. You lived those. For the Jewish people, they also had like 613 laws in total, and there were debates about which one's most important. How do I prioritize these? And so, so he's like, okay, you know, which ones? You know? And Jesus replied, <laughs> it's kind of fascinating. He says this. He says, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Continue on, he says, honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. He basically gives all of the outward commandments from the 10 commandments, all the things that I can see in you and I can judge you for. Right? I mean, I can see if you're committing adultery. I can see if you're murdering someone. I can see if you're lying, right? I can see if you're honoring your mom and dad, if you're being a good neighbor. And again, I mean, this is like the gold standard for the Jewish people. They, they knew this. They grew up knowing this. This is their thing. And yet there was still something in this guy that was unsettled. There was still something there that led him to say, okay, but there's got to be more. 
I've been obeying all these things my whole life, and yet it doesn't feel like it's enough. And so he answered, and here's what he said. He said, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Now, if you, if you grew up in church, and maybe you have a history of going to Sunday school and, and doing the things, and you learned these, right? You learned the Ten Commandments. I had a little bookmark keychain, uh, or uh, bookmark uh, little metal pieces tied together, the Ten Commandments. I mean, you know what it means to be good, per human standards, even per God's standards. You know what that means. And you've been doing the things, and maybe you've been volunteering or serving. Maybe you've gotten involved in some ministry partner. Maybe you give. Maybe you show up. You read your Bible. You pray. I mean, you're doing the things, right? But it's not quite satisfying. You're like, is this it? There's got to be more. What am I missing? What am I missing, Jesus? Jesus. And Jesus' answer, I'm just telling you, it's so compassionate. It really is. And Jesus, I I believe, sees something in this person, a true longing and a desire to know. And Jesus' answer is honest, but man, it is unsettling. Here's what he said. He said, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. Now, there is no selfish motive in this, because if there was, Jesus would be like most of our TV preachers who say, go sell and give to me, right? But that's not what Jesus said. It's not about me. It's not about increasing my, my wealth. He says, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. Now, that's uncomfortable, right? I mean, that's a little unsettling. Because what Jesus is saying to this man is something is possessing your life and you know it. And you have to give up what you are clinging to in order to get the thing you are searching for. Now for this man, it was money. I'm not saying it's money for everybody. That money is neither good nor evil. It's just, it is. It's a tool, right? It's useful. But money was a thing this guy is clinging to. In fact, money had taken the place of God in his life. It had become the little G God for him. And for all of us, right? I mean, to satisfy, here's Jesus' point, to satisfy your soul quest, you've got to surrender the little G gods in your life. And so for this man, it's sell everything, get rid of everything because it's controlling you. It's controlling you. And when you do that, You're making an investment for eternity, and then you can follow me, and you will find eternity, which is the thing you're searching for. Remember, that was the question that the man began with. What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And what Jesus does, it's so interesting because he sets up this tension, this uncomfortable situation, because the man on the one hand was wealthy, he had his needs met, but he was empty. And on the other hand, to get what he was really searching for, he would have to give up the thing he was clinging to for purpose. He would have to give up the thing that he was absolutely afraid to lose in order to put God in the top position, the priority position in his life. Money took the place of God. He's discouraged. He was frustrated. Here's what Matthew tells us, that when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. He was afraid to lose what he had to gain what he truly needed and wanted. And he knew his wealth didn't provide what he was looking for, but he couldn't get himself to give it up. He was afraid to live without it. It was this uncomfortable situation. It was his commitment to the little G God in his life. And so then Jesus turned to his disciples as if this weren't uncomfortable enough. And he said to them, he said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. He goes on, he says, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
Now, how ridiculous is that? Because I thought wealth is a sign that I'm doing the right things, right? I mean, doesn't wealth show that I'm smart and I'm making good decisions and I'm wise and, and I'm successful? I mean, isn't wealth a sign of God's blessing? I'm telling you, 2,000 years ago, that's what the people believed. And quite honestly, that's what many of us believe. Wealth is the symbol that I'm doing all the stuff. And Jesus is like, no, you're wrong. And the disciples, they were so unsettled by this, just as we are. I mean, it's so uncomfortable. It's like, what are you, what are you talking about, Jesus? So they kind of confront him. <laughs> I love what happens next. It never goes well when people confront Jesus, by the way. So uh, when the disciples heard this, they're greatly astonished. Like, what? You know, we've never heard that before. Come on, wealth is good, right? And he asked, they asked, who then can be saved? I mean, if it's not the rich people who have God's blessing, then who is it? I mean, come on, Jesus. Isn't wealth the indicator? Isn't it the thing that shows that God's blessing is on all these people? It's a fair question, right? So the text says, Jesus looked at them. He looked at them. And the word looked here, it's more like he gazed, like he knew, like Jesus could see this was upsetting. I mean, it was uncomfortable. And he looked at them and he said this, he said, with man, this is impossible. It's impossible, right? Because you can't be good enough. You can't be good enough. All the good deeds in the world will never outweigh the bad. And that whole scale of justice thing, it's all a bunch of baloney. It doesn't matter. You cannot save yourself. That's what Jesus was saying. There aren't enough good deeds you can do. You can't buy your way in. And his point was that the external things that we look to for satisfaction in life will not satisfy us. They'll just keep us on the soul quest, wondering, isn't there something more? I mean, we acquired all the stuff, we got all the things, we earned the you know, degree, we got the promotion, and yet we still wonder, isn't there more? Wealth isn't enough. He says, with man, it is impossible. But, he says, with God, all things are possible. God gives you what you need. Salvation is a gift, it's not something you earn. Grace is given freely. It's not something that you can somehow buy. It's impossible for you, but it's not impossible for him. Now, Peter, he's listening to all this, the same Peter we talked about last week, and he's like, okay, but what about the money thing? <laughs> I'm still kind of stuck on the money thing, right? And like, come on, Jesus, you know, because you got to know Peter's story. When Jesus invited Peter to follow him, uh, remember, Peter was out on a boat. He had, you know, had a rough night of fishing. There was nothing. And then, then Jesus is like, well, throw out your nets one more time. And G Peter's like, that's stupid. You know, I've been out here all day. And he, he throws them out. He pulls it in. There are so many fish. He has to go get his friends to help him bring in this catch of fish. I mean, it was like a life-changing catch of fish. And right after that, Jesus says, hey, why don't you leave those fish behind and come follow me? And Peter did it, right? I mean, that, that's the account of Peter. He did it. And so he's like, I, I did what you asked that guy to do, Jesus, right? So, so, so there's got to be some kind of reward here for me. I, I, this isn't making sense, right? I, I did this because you were going to give me something. You were going to give me something. So Matthew tells us, Peter answered, Jesus, he's like, we've left everything to follow you. What then is for us? I mean, we did it. We did what you said. What do we get out of it? What's our prize? <laughs> What's our prize? And Jesus' answer, we're not even going to look at it because it's so mysterious. I mean, nobody even commented. I read a whole bunch of commentaries. I'm like, what does this mean, right? And, and nobody knows. It's just like, okay, Jesus made this thing about the end time and nobody knows exactly what it means. You can go read it for yourself. But essentially, he's like, Peter, you missed the point. You missed the point. So let me kind of redirect you. And when he redirected Peter, he made a promise, not just for Peter, not just for the other 11 who were with him, but for all of us, for all who would follow Jesus someday, for all people who would be willing to give up our little G gods, the things that we kind of place as an unhealthy place of importance in our lives, and we surrender them. And here's what he said. Here's the promise. He said, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children <laughs> or fields for my sake, basically every, everyone who's willing to surrender all, Everyone who's willing to put God in the number one place in their life, he said that person will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. 
that it may seem big in the moment, it may seem like this big, momentous sacrifice, but in the end, it will be nothing because of what God's going to do with it. And there will be a blessing. It will be a minimal sacrifice compared to what's coming in the end. And the promise of eternal life where you experience that treasure. It was the very thing this man was looking for. It's the very thing he was looking for in his soul quest that he was unable to find. Remember, eternal life, that's the thing. That's what he was asking about. How do I get this? And Jesus sets up for him this battle of priorities. And it's true. Life is a battle of priorities, isn't it? And we can acknowledge that. And what's important to know is Jesus wasn't saying any of these things are necessarily bad. I mean, the things that we want to prioritize in our life are not necessarily bad things. In fact, many of them are good things. Whether it's our family, our kids, our parenting, retirement, travel, relaxing, church, faith, Work. I mean, those aren't bad things. Volunteering, serving, all of those things are important and they're good. But the real question is what's most important? What's most important in your life? What gets the top priority? And Jesus was giving an invitation for this young man to say, Are you going to prioritize me over everything? And the young man walked away knowing the answer to that. And his answer was, no. No. I'm wealthy. I have something else. The question for you and the question for me, it's not just for you, it's for me too, is what is most important? I mean, really, what's most important? There are actually two indicators that I think we can look at to get an idea, if you're not sure what's most important in your life, two indicators that I think we can look look to because they're limited, they're limited, and yet they give us access to things, to stuff, to life, to whatever. I mean, we have limited resources, but, but they give us what we're looking for. And so if we can pay attention to where those things get invested and used, it's really a good indicator of what is most important to us. The first one, it's time. Time, it's how we spend our time. How do you use your time? You may not know the answer to that. So track it for a week, two weeks, a month. Just see, where does your time go? Now, I did some simple math on this, and I was blown away, quite honestly. Because if you assume you sleep eight hours a day, which I do not, but (laughs) you may. If you assume you sleep eight hours a day, and you work 40 to 50 hours a week, or go to school 40 to 50 hours a week, you subtract that time, you know, guess how many hours you have left? 62. Simple math. Now, if I had just asked you a few minutes ago, do you think you have 62 hours of free time in your life? Be like, what? (laughs) I mean, what do you do for those 62 hours? I mean, really, what do you do for those 62 hours? How many hours are spent binge watching? How many hours are spent on the endless scroll or getting angry about politics? How many hours are, are spent, you know, investing in your kids? How many hours are spent investing in your marriage if you're married? How many hours are spent? Where does your time go? 62 hours. I'm I mean, that's a more than a work week. How you spend your time is a good indicator because you have limited time. It's a good indicator of what's important. We give our time to what's a priority. Where do you spend your time? What would it indicate is most important in your life? Here's the second one, money. Money. Now, as I said, Jesus wasn't trying to get the guy's money. And I'm not trying to get your money either. Just know that. But we put our money where our heart is. 
our money flows where our heart goes. I mean, that's just how it is. You love your kids, you invest in your kids. You have financial investment in your kids. I love to eat and live indoors. My money goes to those things. <laughs> you probably do too. I love my wife, right? Money goes there, right? I mean, it, money goes to the things that we value, the things that we love, the things that are near and dear to our hearts. So where does your money go? Do you even know what percentage of your money goes to the things of God that are part of his kingdom? It's really simple to find out. Just look at your credit card statements or your bank statements and make a percentage of how much you made versus how much gets sent out. I'm just telling you, our money is a good indicator of what we truly value. Jesus says, look, you'll be restless. You'll be searching, you'll be looking for something until he is in the top place of your life. It's really important to know that following Jesus, it will cost you something. Sometimes I think we Christians have given this misnomer of like, oh, just follow Jesus, it's all unicorns and ponies and everything's great. No, I mean, it costs you, it is costly. It costs time, it costs resources, it costs being invested. I love what Sherry shared earlier about the, the oh my goodness, but it costs something, but there is a blessing attached to it. Knowing that God has something for you. But here's something nobody else is going to tell you, or very few people will tell you. And it's that the little g gods in our life cost us something too. In fact, they cost us the same things. They cost us our time and our money. The difference is they don't deliver anything of value. Lasting value. There's an Irish proverb I ran across years ago that says, good as drink is. And the Irish know all about drink, right? I mean, (laughs) they love to drink. It says, good as drink is, it ends in thirst. (coughs) Satisfies you for a minute. But in the end, there's not much that lasts. Yesterday, I had the privilege, many of you know Todd and Roberta Cook, who attend uh, church here. And it's Roberta's brother, Fred, uh, who had Down syndrome. He was a regular here at Community Church whenever he'd be in town visiting. He lived up in Wisconsin for most of the year, but during the summers and Christmas time, he'd be here. And we love Fred. He was just such a beautiful life. And yesterday, (laughs) there was a box with ashes in it. They got put in the ground, representing his life. And do you know what he took with him? Nothing. But Fred's life modeled something that was so beautiful that what mattered to him wasn't the stuff. What mattered to him was the people. What mattered to him was his faith. I mean, he was such a beautiful man of faith. Following Jesus will cost you something, but you gain it all back in the end, and it's better. Here's the thing. Not following Jesus will cost you everything because it's still going to take your time, it's still going to take your money, and in the end, it promises nothing other than momentary satisfaction, momentary happiness, here today and gone tomorrow. One of the most tragic things about this account with this rich young man who came to Jesus is that scholars believe that Jesus was actually giving this man the invitation to be one of his disciples. One of the 12. Can you imagine that? What God was setting before him, what Jesus was offering him. I mean, think about Peter. He got to walk on flipping water. Right? I mean, he, he had breakfast with Jesus on the beach after he was crucified. They, I mean, they, they saw things that you and I can only imagine seeing. Did they sacrifice to do it? Absolutely. Was it worth it in the end? I think they'd say yes. Do you know what this rich young man's name was? I don't either. Nobody does today, 2,000 years later. We know the names of Peter and James and John and Matthew and the others who had the privilege of being a part of this incredible story God has been telling. People name their children after them. Nobody names their children after the rich young man. 
You just never know what hangs in the balance of your willingness to say yes and to put God in that top spot in your life. Missionary Jim Elliott, he said this. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And so Jesus, he's telling his disciples, he's telling Peter, yeah, you sacrificed a lot, but God's got something so much better for you in the end. It is costly to follow me, but it is so worth it. So let me just ask you, as we kind of bring this to a close, what do you need to do to surrender? What do you need to surrender to follow Jesus? What are you holding on to? Maybe today's a reminder of like, no, I am all in. I have committed it all. I have said, Jesus, you are number one. And if that's you, that's great. Let this just be a reminder. In the moments that are hard and difficult and you ask, is this worth it? The answer is yes, it is worth it. It is so worth it. But if that's not you and there is something standing in the way, what is that thing? What are you holding on to? For the man, it was his wealth. It may not be wealth for you. What's keeping you from following him? fully? Is it security? Is it your identity? Is it pleasure? Is it stuff? Maybe it is money. I'm just telling you, until you're willing to surrender that, you will feel this restlessness. You will feel this emptiness. Jesus told a parable about the kingdom of heaven once. I I love this. Here's what he said. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. This last summer, there's a guy in Kentucky who found a treasure hidden in his field. You remember reading about that story? He found all these these Civil War era monies. It was crazy amounts of money. So Jesus is like, just imagine, there's a treasure hidden in the field. Imagine stumbling on that. And then he said this. He says, when a man found it, he hid it again. Why would he do that? Because he discovered something of great value and he realized it wasn't his field. Right? He's like, oh shoot, I don't want anybody else to find out what this is. So you know what he did? Jesus says this. He says, and in his joy, like he was so excited. He couldn't believe what he had stumbled upon. It was so great. It was so wonderful. In his joy, he went and sold all he had and he bought that field. And it was a sacrifice to buy it. It cost him everything. But he gained something so great. So great in return. My friends, that's the invitation for us. There's a treasure in a field. It can be yours. This man had no idea what was being offered to him. And so he ended up missing out. I'm just telling you, you never know what hangs in the balance of your willingness to say yes. To say, God, you're going to be number one in my life. You are the most important thing. Nothing else is going to get in my way. I'm going to pursue knowing you more than anything else, serving you, loving you more than anything else. You will be my God. The man had obeyed all the other commands. He just forgot the first one. No other God besides me. The question is, what will you do? We're going to pick it up there next Sunday, and I hope you can be back with us. Heavenly Father, Thank you for preserving this account for us. All these years later, thank you for not leaving that man hopeless without an opportunity. But God, unlike that man, would we not waste the opportunity you give to us? Knowing, God, that it's not about how good we are, how perfect we try to be, but it's about putting you putting you in the number one spot in our lives, having no other God beside you. So God, as we think about the little G gods that so easily pop up and distract us and vie for our attention and our affections and loves, God, would we be willing to surrender them? Give each one of us wisdom to know what we may be holding on to, what may have kind of moved you out of that first place spot. And then Father, give us the courage Give us the courage to surrender it. Believing that you have something far better for us. We just thank you for that. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.